reminded me that it is our custom to take the speaker, um, with or without his consent, down to Sugo's, uh, the restaurant in um, uh, uh, South Kensington. And as many of you are, would like to or want to join us down there, um, it's about 10 to 12 pounds a head for um, a very nice Italian meal, and we'd like your company. So, um, Without more ado, I'll introduce uh, Derek Barber to explain his rather cryptic title for his talk. Right, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and good evening, everybody. Um, what happened really was that, that Tony rang me up and asked me, well, well in fact, Pat Woodrow, first of all, rang me up and asked me that I'd do this, and then um, I rang Tony about it, and he said, what about a title? He caught me on the hop. So I said something about packets, and in the end, with some discussion, that's where we got the title from. Um, I thought I got this right, actually. Uh, I remember, and I've written this down, see, so that, that's why I'm reading it out. I'll stop reading things out. Um, I remember Donald Davis at MPL coming into my office one morning in discussing the future research program. He said, we should be doing something about data communications. And I think that would have been probably the late summer of 65. I only wish I could actually remember the exact date. I looked through pages and so on, and I've sort of bracketed it, but I can't actually remember it within about two or three months. Anyway, his feeling, he said, was that data ought to be handled uh, by a network, rather in the way that parcels or packets are handled in the postal system. At least that's the way I always remembered it. And that's why I gave the title to Tony. Imagine my surprise then when only a few days later Donald actually rang me up. Now he'd seen this notice, there's going to be a notice laid out about this, well, typical of Donald, he knows everything that's going on, it was has done. So he rang me up and he said um, that his recollection was that the packet idea came a bit later, he said. Indeed, he said at the time he initiated a small survey of how the word packet would translate into most of the world languages and uh, to, in order to judge its suitability. And the result was generally favourable except for Russian, where it was already in use as a data block in a link protocol. But he decided that wasn't much of a constraint, so packet it was. So I think packet's actually, I think he's, he's, he's basically wrong. I'm sure he did mention packet that first uh, meeting he had with me. But of course it was actually packet switching which I think came from the PPT. Anyway, bang went the title of this talk. You know, I thought, my God, what am I going to do now? I've got a title that's meaningless. And it put me off. And I actually didn't do anything until the middle of April. And then I panicked, actually, and I hastily started fishing out my archives, or, or junk, as my wife has kept calling me over the years. And the uh, <laughs> particular stuff I've got at MPL. But anyway, I, I, I kept nearly all the files that were sent to me to be destroyed. You know, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll destroy them. And I actually, <laughs> them. So I could actually tell you a thing or two if I dare, but I mean, there were some things, even for the day, I, I, I really dare, dare say, not, not in an open meeting. Because there was a lot of interesting, you know, politics going on in those days. But I was actually overwhelmed with this information. I had stacks of it, stacks of this information. And um, I thought, gosh, you know, what am I going to do? And I found it very hard to choose a structure. How could I get a hand on it? And in the end, I decided that I'd sketch out a number of approaches um, as a basis for questions and discussion later on. And as Tony told me to make it anecdotal, I try and use those as a peg. Now, whether it's what you expected here, I don't know. It's what you're going to get. Well, it's actually, now I'll depart from my, my script, it's actually not quite what you're going to get because I produced these slides. Um, in order to make them anecdotal. I was going to write anecdotes on, on the end, but I got overtaken with events because I found a, a, an enormous amount of stuff. And later on, you can come down and look at it. And I'll just tell you what it is. So, in preparation, there's a um, MPL activities. These are selected things out of the file, roughly chronological order. Papers, say, where Donald was telling us what we ought to be doing next, and that kind of thing here, and in, in, in order. Um, there's some very early stuff when I first came to MPL, which is, is uh, almost setting, setting sort of a thing for me anyway. Um, there's the uh, work, other events, things like the MinTech network, which you may have heard of, and various things like that which went on. And then there's the EIN um, story here. And I've also got this file, 
um, which has got rather a lot of photographs um, related to technology and so on. And I even included one from 1929 when the first talkies came in. You might be interested in that. Anyway, that's the background to what I'm going to talk to you about. So if I can switch this thing on. Oh, it off the top. Oh, very clever. Yeah. OK, so that was fun. Just a moment. I've got a small technical problem here. Right. Um, well, there it is. The Fraser K. Burke Packet Networks, or Memoirs of the Origin of, of Networks. Well, today, of course, um, we're absolutely blinded by all these words, lands, mans, and so on. I listed a few of these sort of buzzwords that have been around, but how did it uh, all start? When did it all start? Well, this was the sort of problem. Can you all hear me, by the way? Oh, good. Are they all, all you can't? You didn't know what I asked you, but I saw some nodding at the back. That's fine. And I thought, well, how am I going to structure this? So I first of all had a grand design. I thought, right. We, we talk about antecedents and chronology and neighboring technology and so on. And I was going to have a great sort of uh, array of all this stuff. And then I was going to talk about connections and coincidences and how these, you know, chance makes things happen. And this I found uh, very often is, is quite important. Uh, but, so then, and so there it was, I started this great big array and I was going to put in sort of stars and notes and so on about what happened where over a period of time. And I realised that by the time I finished it would actually be covered in stars and it would be meaningless. So I just started that one. <laughs> <laughs> and I then thought, I, I, the, only way, the only way to do it really is to, is to see it from my point of view um, and you know, how I observe things. And therefore you need a bit of a background because I think that... Um, I was helped by where I started work. I actually started work in the post office uh, engineering department, and Frank Hewlett's in, in the audience somewhere there, and this probably will bring a, a call with him. Very quick, I went as a youth in training, did the rounds in the, in, in the workshop, the different labs and so on, which was jolly good groundwork. It meant that I had contemporaries there, which in later life were key people very often in the post office, and that turned out to be quite useful. Um, I actually worked on the London, Birmingham, one to code for television, and I remember the night when the Birmingham transmitter opened, uh, November 1949, when the line went down at five minutes before the film was due to go live. At least we thought so. Eventually it turned out that the film had broken in the telly <coughs> and they had to rewind it before they could start. Anyway, those are, the, the network was perfectly all right, you see. It was just the fifth equipment. Anyway, um, I eventually got, uh, got a degree in evening classes and um, well, actually, what I did, I got the, the, the part one, then got to the open experimental competition, and uh, I got put into a research branch, and I worked in the war room uh, under the ground, testing contacts for nearly a year until I couldn't stand it anymore, and I transfer, and I got put into RC41, which was a marvellous division, actually, and uh, working on pulse and bar testing and television links, and then I went in for, I got my degree then, and I went in for the open executive engineer and the open scientific officer. Now, this is a coincidence. Um, in the executive engineer um, interview, they asked me, why do you have a permanent magnet in a telephone earpiece? And do you know, I couldn't for the light and I couldn't think. So I made, gave some sort of muffled answer and they didn't give me the job. So <laughs> the second one was the sign it off. I got through that and got sent down to MPL. That's, that's a sort of a coincidence, isn't it? I could have, if I'd known why you had a permanent magnet, does anybody in the audience know, by the way? If I have a permanent magnet and an earpiece, I would have uh, still been working in the post, I guess. Well, I'd have retired by now. But, uh. Okay, so I went down to MPL, and there's a bit of background still, painting the background. Went down to MPL. Now, direct, the Bullard was, uh, the Bullard, the director was Bullard, not the other way around. Um, and at that time, when I went for the interview, which was probably about March or that sort of time, maybe even earlier, um, in 54, um, there were two uh, different sections, control makers in, in metrology, and there was electronics in mass division. Uh, you'll see why I'm telling you this in a moment. Um, this was run by Dick Tissard and um, Coldbrook, and I can't remember his first name. Crack. Was, hmm? Crack. 
Oh, thank you very much. You know, I, I looked through all my files and I couldn't find it anywhere. Anyway, he was, um, I think, head of that. Anyway, I went down for interview and Colbert was on the board and so was Bullard. There was his cops and a few other people and I sat down in the, the large conference room at the end of the big oval table there and they just said, where have you, you know, tell us. And I said, well, I've been at uh, Dollis said, and I've been working on this digital sideband transmission. And Bullard said, just a minute. He said, that's a technical term. He said, um, you, you must explain it. And Colbert led forward, he said, uh, perhaps I can handle this one, because I had a chat for about 10 minutes about, you know, <laughs> modulation <laughs> methods and things like that. And then what I looked at him, I said, Christ, he said, I'm due up in town. He said, I'm late already. Nobody else has got questions. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. You know, that's it. I said, I got you, man. I think you've done it. <laughs> um, well then, Dick Tizar got appointed to the uh, London, he went to London School of Economics, I remember, and so the, um, oh that's right, I got a cold book that died actually in between, and it, it was all, the end of the year almost, September, October, and I thought I was going to be turned down yet for that, yet another job you see, but eventually I got a letter saying that cold book had died, and that um, that was run by the Vienna delay, but they formed a division, Dick Tizar was superintendent, but, and I got working on guided weapons data process, and well, Tizard went to London School of Economics. Ted, actually, was acting superintendent, I guess, if I remember it, uh, for a while. And in fact, it was Ted who ran the... Only one said it, Tizard. Is there? <laughs> Do you know, I haven't got the word in my spinning check, and that's what I'm about. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, and I remember Ted bringing me up one day, this would have been, it was in 1958, so that, that it, and I remember Ted bringing me up, he said, he said, I'd, I'd like you, he said, to represent us on the IE measurement control section. And I said, oh, I don't think I can do that, you know. And he said, oh yes, I'm confident, I'm sure you can. So in the end, I, you know, I, I did it. And it was some years afterwards when I got to that sort of position, I realised he was just trying to find a mug to take on the job. But there we are, that's <laughs> another anecdote, I guess. Well, then we did a digital, I've got pictures of some of this stuff, a digital plotting table, optical gradients. There was a general background in, in you know, sort of circuit development and, and various things like that. Um, I built a very high speed analog amplifier, um, amplifier multiplier. We did. And then we started work on an alcohol still as part of an adaptive control program under Percy Hammond. Uh, I'm concentrating down this slide and I'm just saying Ted with Ace etc. because that's another story altogether which I'm not really confident to say, but although I will wait, say one or two things in passing later on. Um, I got my PSO there, I, I know that because I remember Sutherland, who was the director then, uh, it was Christmas time, we used to have a party over in the hut, and I remember I was strumming a note with some notes on a, a double bass that we made out of a broomstick and an old wooden box. And Sutherland walked in and he said, um, uh, he said, I, I thought you'd just like to know, he said, that, because that, uh, I'd been up for the board earlier in the year, and he said, I thought you'd just like to know that you were the top of the list of the people who didn't get their PSO this year. <laughs> so I said, well, well, thank you very much, director, thank you very much. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I got it the next year without going for the ball, so that, that was fair enough. So that, that, must, that must have been 62 when I was playing the double bass. Um, anyway, I went to the uh, States in 63, uh, and that was um, very interesting. I opened my eyes, I spent um, four weeks over there and came back on the Mauritania, and that's another story. But um, I went to MIT, I saw Project Mac, I saw the PDP-1, um, I saw the sketch pad work that, that um, Ivan Sutherland was doing, and that has a, a link, a connection with Labby Roberts, uh, uh, which I'll mention later on the song. Um, and really, as a result of the uh, uh, column instrumentation, uh, we got working on this data the presence system on uh, standard interfaces and data transmission, and that sort of paved the way for the networking work. So, let me just move it on. So, I think if I've got, I've got myself right, we've got up to about 1965, here we are. And by that time, Dunworth was acting director. There was, um, yes, 
Hartley was still um, running the autonomics division. Um, the SPSOs were Percy um, uh, Hammond, Ted Newman, and Donald. Then I think Donald was deputy superintendent. And you had, uh, and again, I'm basically going down this path. I was under Percy doing adaptive control, <coughs> MPL standing in face. Um, I became chairman of BSI DPE 10, which is how I found out about politics in standards, which is a, a most uh, uh, interesting uh, situation. And it dragged on for some time. Um, I got involved, for example, with AECA, and that was about the first time I met Brian Oakley. And again, several times Brian Oakley has appeared in, in, in my career. Um, we did a big show at Data Fair 1967, but eventually, um, at a Berlin meeting in, in 69, uh, the BS4421 British standard interface was being offered as an um, international standard. There was a dead heat, actually, and the chairman cast it, a casting vote against it. So, in the end, by October uh, 70, I actually finally gave up and did a of bits of notes and so on in these files to explain the background of that. Um, because basically, other things anyway were beginning to build up, like the data communication network. And in fact, this um, meeting in uh, mid-65 or, or mid to late 65, rather like packets, um, I think came about uh, partly because of the work I've been doing there anyway. And I think Donald sort of found me a useful sounding board for the discussions. But Donald himself, had, um, had, I had a look in the records and there was no mention of data communications there. He went to uh, the ICAP 65 in the States and I've got documents about that. I think he um, came back from that thinking that really you ought to handle data uh, in a network in the same way that you handle data in a timeshare machine, really time slicing, you know, and, and, and doing resource allocation. And I think that was basically where the, the, the thoughts came from. Anyway, I can remember these sort of discussions, and um, in, the, uh, in fact, on the 18th of March, Donald gave a lecture at NPL, but there are some one or two papers before that which never have been, never been published, which I've got copies of, which are here. But basically, uh, Donna was going public then um, with with packet, a packet network and a packet of ideas, and um, we formed autonomic projects because it was still autonomic then. Uh, number six, data communications, early in 1967, and I've actually got the the project set up. Uh, you know, yeah. So that's that's the sort of background. I hope I haven't gone too too much long on background, but I think. It's actually very important <coughs> to see that, that everything sort of follows on. You know, you, you're setting the scene really in one area for a movement in another. I, I would have liked to have said more about the technology, but in looking back at it, for example, when we came to build the network, TTL logic, we've been using RTL, TTL logic had just about come out. I doubt if we could have built uh, it without TTL logic, and so on and so on. Okay? You, 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 the technology always, if you're lucky, comes at the right time. A thing I didn't say, um, about we talked about the plotting table, and I, I, I meant to mention this, because <coughs> Roger will, be, uh, will remember this, I, I got some transistors in from BTH, actually to build that plotting table, and it was an interesting design because it had uh, um, a sort of binary point, and then it had about 10 places of binary fractions, and then I've forgotten how many places up there, and you, this plotting table, um, uh, you really drove drove this thing from, again, there's a paper there, so I won't elaborate. The point is that we got these transistors, we made these sort of 20 place um, uh, dividers, and we didn't know, at least I didn't know, that you've got oxygen poisoning. And I don't think we ever had a situation where all of the transistors and all of the, the, the stages in the dividers were actually working at one time. Now that created some problems of, of accuracy, as you can imagine. And Roger actually came over to me because Ted had got a, uh, you got an interest in, do you remember that, that um, learning uh, teacher machine that you did? Yeah. Which are films where you've got coded track on it in order to, to uh, move around. It was a brilliant idea. And Roger came, the first time I met Roger, he came over and said, Ted had heard that I got some transistors and he thought they might be interesting. And uh, you came over. And I've got a, a, a wooden ball with nails hammered in and these transistors there and little lights and they've got to divide by, you know, three or four places and a multi-bar 
And I'm totally thrilled because I've been used to doing things with valves, you know, drilling holes and minor heaters and so on. And then with these little tiny things and these lights flashing out, and yeah, you know, I couldn't couldn't make enough of it. And I remember when she coming over and seeing that. Anyway, sorry, that is an, uh, uh, an anecdote um, that I meant to say. Anyway, um, we, we uh, where, where do I get to? Yes. But what, what happened was that after, soon after that, uh, Donald actually became, uh, after he left, um, Donald became superintendent, I think. I, I'm you know, a bit hasty about exactly how that happened. But I think there was Percy was one of the SPSOs, and Ted was, was the other one, then, I think. And then um, so Ted really had half the division, and then I gradually picked up, I got the SPSO in, in 69, and I picked up the other half. And I, for, for a while, I thought we had a, a marvellous team, the three of us, we used to be on Monday mornings in Donald's office and really kick around ideas about either you know, running a division or what we might do or whatever. And I look back on that as a time when, um, I spent most of you do, you look back on your career and there were times when everything went right, you were with the right people and ideas flowed and it was, it was really good. And that, that was one such, such time then. And um, so that out, 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 out of that, of course, came the... Um, Data Communications work, um, Roger, of course, took over that. Um, I hope I've not left the team people out. I, I very much put these things from, from memory, but we had uh, Keith Bartlett with, with a hardware team. Uh, we had um, software team, Peter Wesley, and John Lords, Carol Walsh. We had um, Pat Woodruff stay with Alan Davis uh, for a while on the BS4421, um, and was, I think, very instrumental in the big display that I mentioned, and uh, well, I've got information about it in, in the class here. Donald Bell, I'm not quite sure where, where he was reporting to at that time, but he, um, I think, was responsible for the PL516 uh, land, which was written for the, for the um, Honeywell 516 machine, and I think Brian Richmond wrote the cross compiler for the KDF9. But anyway, we had a Mark I and a Mark II system, and the Mark II was, was an altogether better uh, a better design, but I, I don't want to go into technical detail, I don't think that's what we really, if I could actually, and I dare now, <laughs> there we are. Um, and then there was of course various machines around, um, the Honeywell 516 for the, for the network switch, modular one on which Scrap ran, and there was Peter Cashin, uh, Mike, I think it was Mike Robinson, um, I mentioned Peter Cashin particularly because he actually went to Canada in the end and was responsible for the design of the switching software on the Canadian data pack switch. There's another one of these connections and, and so on that I could, I could bring out. And also David was, was, uh, was involved with the, the police, I think it was C11, Ted probably remember, remember that, and the police national computer. And I remember Superintendent Halliday, or was it Assistant Commissioner Halliday coming from office one day and the uh, first time I'd ever met anybody at that, that, at that level, and that was quite, quite interesting. Anyway, Mass Division had the KDF9, a PDP11 front end on which ran the edit service which was uh, eventually made available on the network. So that's painting a bit of a uh, picture for people that were involved. Um, and I hope maybe later on, you know, Peter Hilson bring out their, their, their memories of these things. Um, now, at that time, in external interactions, I mean, I've only just been able to touch on these because there's a mass of stuff in my files and I'm sure that they, they weren't, weren't anywhere near uh, typical of, of exactly what went on. But Donald's uh, talk in March had over 100 people there. There were certainly Phil Kelly and George Gallery, and I think there were 18 people from the process all together. I mentioned Phil Kelly and George Gallery because they, they um, featured quite a lot in, in things that happened afterwards, at least as far as I think Roger and I were concerned. Um, then Arthur Lewis from Intech, and that's when there has been a paper um, written by Paul Bannon in the Rand um, Corporation, which had sort of in a sense foreshadowed packet switching, in a way, for, for a speech networks, for voice networks, but nobody knew about it, so it certainly didn't in enter into the um, uh, our thinking at all. Um, and then, uh, as a result of that, Donald actually wrote an internal paper which I've got, which was really his lecture pol his polished up. And, 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 uh. and then the, the Real Time Club was formed early in '67, 
Rex Malik, I remember Stan Gill was very uh, important then, and Donald, of course. And um, that real time club uh, was responsible for some things down here. But in the meantime, Roger actually went to the um, ACM Symposium on Operating System Principles at Gatlinburg. And there wasn't a, a conference about networking. You know, of course, it, 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 such a subject hardly existed. So the operating system seemed to be, since it was time sharing of a sort, seemed to be the right place to go, I suppose. I don't remember exactly the background. Anyway, Roger went over to this thing, and he gave a, uh, we always had papers with very long titles for some reason or other, but he gave this paper called, as you can read, Digital Communication Network for Computers Giving Rapid Response at Remote Terminals. And Larry Roberts was there. Now I mentioned Larry Roberts. He'd been involved with Ivan Sutherland on Sketchpad on the on, on the graphics work, and he, um, if you like, had been uh, extended the concept of a, a support graphics processor to the idea of a network and so on. That's the, if you like, the train of thought coming through there. And he was then talking about multiple computer networks and intercomputer communication. But I mean, Donald, uh, um, Roger was certainly could supply more. Uh, information since he was there, but I'm reading through the, the, the papers, it's pretty clear that Roger actually convinced Larry that what he was talking about was all wrong, and that the way that MPL were proposing to do it was, was actually right. And I've got some notes of the, uh, I wrote the notes of the meeting actually, saying that at first Larry was sceptical, but several of the other people there sided with Roger, and eventually Larry was overwhelmed by the the numbers I think. And that, that actually gave birth really to, to ARPANET um, because Larry became, uh, joined, um, he may already have been in, in ARP, I don't know, but he certainly joined soon after and came, became responsible for ARPANET. Anyway, out of this, um, one of my problems here is the timing. You know, events happen and it's difficult to get them chronologically right, but certainly um, by July 68, um, the Real Time Club had organised this great big um, uh, event in the Royal Festival Hall, and again, what you'll probably mem remember, remember that there, um, probably, where's Pat on? He said in the back, you probably remember it as well. I know we, we, we worked jolly really hard to produce uh, uh, various bits of kit and so on up there, and uh, there was a, a, a sort of a debate. Uh, I mean, we actually showed, I don't know how we did it actually, because we didn't have the network working then, did we? But I think we, we did we in 68. This had been probably just about. Anyway, we were able to put on this show of, of either simulated or real using a, a use of networks. And uh, there was this debate between Stan Gill and, and Jim Merriman um, uh, about this. Because the post office, of course, um, well, at the top levels, anyway, to be fair, some of the technical people were, were, were with this, but at the top level, it, really, they're all telephone people. And it, it must have been very hard to take on board something very new to approach. Um, so there was this sort of problem. Although, interestingly enough, um, when I was in the Albi prep, but I'll probably finish up with that uh, at the end if we've got time. Um, the, I remember Jim Merriman coming along and actually uh, sort of almost pleading to, to get something going in the network area in Albi. Uh, and, and he actually was quite helpful because of his, you know, um, sort of reputation and so on, it helped actually with Brian Oates that Jim Mellon came down and said we must have some sort of network in, 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 in the novel. But anyway, that's, that's another story. So in the spring of 69 there were GPO studies, um, I think George Alley had been out, Roger was seconded there um, and, and with Mike Smith. Mike Smith was a great big fellow with an enormous great beard. And I remember we came back, I think we were in Paris, we came back in the plane and I think Mike Smith had been He'd been smoking or something, and his cigarette somehow had fallen uh, in front of the, the seat. And he got out like this, and a little Japanese was in this seat, and there's this man with a beard came over the top and said, Well, give me my cigarette back, or whatever. Yeah, I wonder if the chap may have had a heart attack. Yeah. Anyway, that's, uh, that's uh, funny how these things stick in the mind. <laughs> anyway, uh, autumn 1969, the MIN network proposal. Um, and funny enough, that we, we, Roger and, and Donna came round to my house and actually we had one evening discussing this, I remember, putting ideas together, and we were actually sitting right by the, the bench on which I now have 
far more computing power sitting there, which is how I did these slides, than we had anywhere at MPL at the time. It's unbelievable what's happened with technology. Yeah, that's, that's my way. And in November 69, I went to the USA, and I actually saw the first three ARPANET nodes at Bolt, and Newman, ready to be shipped out to the West Coast. I actually saw them going out to soap tests. So um, that, that was really quite uh, exciting, that. I also um, was always trying to spread the gospel. I remember going round and, and with a whole set of slides about this thing, giving the sort of the, the talk. And when I came back, I wrote my um, report, which is in, in, in here, and a note, uh, and I, I'd forgotten this actually, until a bit fast, and, and the, the director uh, was a bit worried in case I'd be giving away all our ideas and so on, and, and uh, sort of sent a, a note questioning whether my, you know, whether I'd been doing the right thing. And I was, I've got Donald's response there. Donald uh, was backing me up and he said, you know, uh, we couldn't get anything close, I was interested. There's no way of getting things off the ground. And, you know, we really had to go around telling everybody what we're doing to try and make something happen. So I'm quite really, I've forgotten all that happened, but I found it in my files. Anyway, other network related, I, I must say something about some of the other things that were going on. Um, I understand I've got 40 minutes. So, okay. okay. Um, there was a lot going on. I mean, there's no way that I can possibly paint the picture. I mean, even if I knew all of the things, and I certainly didn't, because a lot of things were going on in parallel. Um, and I mean, Donald um, was an amazing person, actually. The amount of work he used to get through, the things he used to do. And I know I was, I used to be overawed, actually. I used to, I used to work quite hard, and I'd, I'd come in in the morning, and there's Donald, he'd got a pile of papers, set there, he was knocking the stuff out, you know. And he'd obviously read everything that had been put in front of me, he was ready to discuss. And I, I actually got quite depressed for a while. Uh, I really did. And, and, I, and then I found that he didn't go to bed at about half past one in the morning. He'd be up again at six and doing things like that. And, and, uh, and there was obviously no way that an ordinary person could, 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 could keep up with him. And, but I do remember um, some years, I think, afterwards, we were at a meeting somewhere and we were philosophizing about where can people would go and what they would do. And we were saying how they would cut out work so that people would have leisure time. It's ridiculous, isn't it? We got it wrong. But anyway, people had all this leisure time and computers would do all the work and so on. And, and Donald turned, he says, he said, I find that amusing. He said, coming from someone who works harder than most people I know. And you know, I, I, I sort of blossomed. I thought, what do you know, marvellous accolades from Donald. Anyway, he didn't realise I'd been around the night hill to try and keep up with him. Um, anyway, this, 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 this Donald, of course, was, was doing all this work as well as the, the, the network. And there was a modern simulation. Um, there was the, the, an 18 node network. Again, I've got in, in, in information about all this stuff which you can look at later. Um, and it, 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 interestingly enough, uh, it, uh, two and a half hours of KDF9 time would cover half a second of runtime on the network. You know, an amazing um, ratio, really. It just shows how slow the KDF9 was. <laughs> um, and then Roger Healy with Win Price did some work. Um, Fessy, Kelly uh, Black Capo called, uh, and Logic were involved. Then, then came the isorhythmic method. I've got a slide to show, show what that, that is at the moment. Um, <coughs> so Donna was doing work on control and congestion there. Then Costa Sol Sol Solomonidis came to join us and uh, did a lot of work on um, hierarchical network simulation uh, with Logica. Um, where are we now in time? 68, 68, 68. Um, and then, of course, there was a Mark II network software. The, the, the first lot had been, I suppose, written in assembler or something. It must have been. Um, it's a tour de force, actually. I, I can remember, um, you know, basically being responsible for, 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 for this. And, and Peter Wilkinson, for five months, actually, nothing really appeared except lots of state transition diagrams. I used to go into his office and I'd look at these things and try to fathom what was going on. And I thought, oh, I do I this? We're going to be all right. Anyway, <laughs> you wouldn't believe it. I mean, because in this day of software engineering and that sort of thing, um, you wouldn't believe it. They loaded this, eventually the software had got written. They loaded it all up. And I think there were two parts that they cleared in a day or something like that. And from then on, it just ran. Now, I, I don't think people today could write 
uh, an assembly package like that with only two plugs in it and have it up and running in a couple of days. But that's actually what happened. But eventually it was all rewritten in uh, this PL516 and other features were added and so on. And, and, um, so, and in doing that we had Ian Dewis <coughs> who came and joined us and then later left and went to British Steel. Uh, where he got involved in them. I think I've got that right. And then Alan Gardner was seconded from the post office to us. So we began to get people coming from outside, the reputation, if you like, they got around of this interesting work going on, and people were sort of coming along and trying to find out about it and getting into the act and so on. Now also, because of the, the attached services, um, scrapbook, I've mentioned that, that uh, Peter Cashin going off to, to um, Canada. Uh, edit, um, Tony Hillman, and I think it was Roger Stoford. Um, then we had a file store uh, built by um, people from um, CAT. And I just realised actually that the Mike Gentry, must be the Mike Gentry who's in, in DTI now. And I, I'd forgotten that actually. I, I, uh, it, it must be the same Mike Gentry. Um, and then we had. Uh, a gateway to EPSS. I, I'm, the timing of this is a bit sort of uncertain, but these are the events that, that went on. You could actually uh, call out through EPSS from Scrapbook through the network and out to a gateway. Um, I think Keith probably was involved with the actual hardware, but I can't remember now. Um, and then, of course, we had <coughs> the um, John Laws, who was very much involved with this, this work. Then I'm moving on towards EIM now. Uh, John Laws was responsible for the Iron Management Centre because of the RSRE now and um, was, um, well, a bit of a cow speaking. I remember, well, now I'll move on to the Iron in a minute. I'll jump this to the here. Just a few words on international things that were going on, just to paint the, the, the background. I already mentioned Arpanet um, and Noah Roberts. Um, Larry Roberts then, I'm not sure I had Telenet that set up, but Telenet was basically a, uh, a company to exploit ARPANET, and Larry Roberts was its um, uh, president, I think the Americans called him, the chairman. <coughs> and then, um, I don't know, the chairman. And then, eventually that was great, taken over by, by great GTN, GTN, great, anyway, it was a, I, I can't remember now, but anyway, it was, that was a, a recognised carrier, so Telenet became respectable, if you like, and, and, and therefore was a, a real um, recognised public operator uh, in, in the PPT terms. Um, I mentioned Peter Kirstein and the UCL with the gateway for ARPANET because over a period of time that has been quite significant, Peter Kirstein's work, in that, that interface to the States. And certainly I, we used to use uh, the ARPANET uh, message service, uh, electronic mail, uh, through that gateway quite often. I did even when I was in, in the Albi director, so I mean that, that, that was quite interesting. Anyway, in Canada, Bill Northern built data at Alex Cullen, Dave Holden. About this time, um, by this time I'd have been, I was um, running EIM, and I got involved in a lot of things because of that. I'm involved in on CCITT, where I've written down at the bottom, and, and set, and, and a whole manner of things um, I, I got involved in. And um, there was this problem about X25. I will digress for a moment because I actually set up the first meeting between John Wedlake of the British Post Office and then the of the French BPT, which actually led to X25. It was a, a problem about virtual calls in EIN, basically. And so I called this meeting and, and that actually did, in the end, lead to X25. But coming to the point, um, there are two philosophies about networking. You, you either make it properly dynamic resource sharing, a datagram network, you know, and provided it all runs much faster than any user, there's a high probability that the user gets what he wants in terms of demand for network. But the PTTs are not happy about that, partly because of the, um, what do you call it, the background, the fact that you know, the telephone network provides a connection and so on and partly because they've got a, um, an obligation to provide a guaranteed service of some kind. You wouldn't think so, of course, but you know, they, they do. And uh, if they give you a circuit and you succeed in dialing it up, then you expect to get uh, four kilohertz. 
So you don't exactly get two and a half, or and it worked off the up and down. <laughs> so um, their philosophy was very much that you had to simulate an end-to-end -end connection. Anyway, you know, we could go on at great length about this because it's still there, connection-oriented, and connectionless, and so on. But the principle behind the argument is very simple. Um, but <clears throat> I'm coming to the point now. So there was this very debate, and he was the man who believed in allocation of resources. So in the RCP network, which is a French network, he had buffers allocated at every switch um, for call. Now, ARPANET had buffers allocated at the ends, but let the dynamic resources be applied. And in, in the French um, network, they didn't even allocate it at the ends. Well, they, they it basically did it in what were mounted to the, the host computers. But Remy Dupay had, 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 had got this sort of real fixation you know, about this. And um, there were these meetings because the PTTs had to get agreement H25. Um, there's an interesting difference between PTTs and computer people when it comes to standards. The PTTs sell services. You can't sell services, you don't have standards. Which is why the bottom three layers of ISO pattern and the top layers are hardly with us yet. Because the, 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 the it's laughing, but it's true, isn't it? You see, the, 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 pressure, the pressures are different. So, but Remy, knowing that, you see, and, and being uh, uh, sort of with the blinks on, he went around telling everybody that if you don't build it our way, we won't, we won't get an agreement. And if we don't get an agreement, none of us will be in business because we won't be able to sell data networks. That's roughly how it went. So, um, there were all these meetings, they were flying all around the world. And I remember being in Canada, must have been 70, probably 76, I should think. Being in Canada and going to this dinner in the evening, and there was Dave Horton there. And I remember somebody getting up and introducing Dave Horton, who'd been involved in X25, and he was now in a position to write a book on uh, how to see Europe on $1,000 a day. <laughs> which at the time, I think it was $25 a day, but that, that, that had a, that, that, the PTD spent a lot of money, actually. Any, anyway, in the air, it's going to be fine paying out for that. Um, well, I talked, I've mentioned uh, the uh, CCAD network in passing. Louis Pilsen was really the, he was the man who believed in dynamic resource allocation. And this was interesting. You know, Remy Dupre, RCP, French PTT, resource allocation, um, Louis Pilsen, dynamic you know, resource allocation, not um, fixed resource allocation. Interesting. Years later, actually, uh, when I visited um, uh, Monsieur de Paris and looked at his uh, Ecole Polytechnique book, I found that um, they'd been in the same year together. As the poly so whether they, you know, they, they actually were putting on an act to fall on the rest of us, I don't know. I often wonder. Anyway, uh, that led to uh, Transpac. Uh, that came, so the French PTT in the end got off the ground uh, with, with the French network. <coughs> and Fraser that did that, of course, was involved in <coughs> EIN with Logica and built the EIN network. Um, the, the Spanish, uh, Dark Forces, really, they were the first people to have a public network. You wouldn't believe it, but they'd got a bank network which they craftily turned into a public network overnight. And, and beat everybody to the, to the post. So there was the, I think CTN, I can't remember what it means now, but something that means like a, 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 a collection of attached terms or something like that. Well then the Swedes were going in a, a, a different direction altogether. They, they had circuit switch network, fast circuit switch networks, X21, and that, that really clouded the water for a long time. That, it, that, that was another we could go on for hours on some of these side issues, which I won. Um, then there was the um, CCITT study group 7, uh, Botnaby, and all uh, that. And this is really where data going to electric circuits gradually migrated. They didn't quite get the connection um, uh, oriented and, and connectionless, but they were moving in that sort of direction even then. And then we had, in the Commission, again we had some rivalries. We had DG3 <coughs> having a UNF project, which the director was Apple Yard. Um, Garth Davis ran it. I had other dealings with Garth and other connection, but they they had a database access network which they were trying to build. And the PTTs, basically, um, Phil Kelly with with uh, the PTTs were actually providing that, essentially designing it. 
And I know about that because I was the only non-PTT person to be on the UNIT Special Protocols Committee. So, uh, so there was that going on. Then you had um, <coughs> Cost 11, um, which was being championed by GG13, which uh, led to EIN, which was the European Packet Research Network, which I do want to say a few words about. And then um, IFIT TC6, that was, that was a very influential group. Uh, it was started by Vince Cerf, or at least by a group of us, with Vince Cerf as the chairman in 1952 at the um, IEEE. 1962, sorry. Uh, yes, it must have been 1972, 72, 72, 72. God, 20 years out. It's getting old. Um, anyway, 19, yeah, 72. And uh, then I took over the chair in 76, and I had that in 76 or 79, and now it's on Kensington and BBN took it over. But that was, again, that was a, an interesting, uh, pivotal role, really, because um, I operated a um, paper. Um, copy and, and distribution service for people. So people would send me a paper and if I thought it was, it was reasonable I'd get it copied and, and then distributed. So for, for a long time in which was the information exchange centre for network. Um, the EIM story. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on that because um, we're getting nearer the, 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 the present I suppose. But um, <coughs> Donald came into my office on the 15th of December, Tuesday afternoon. He said to me, Doug, he said, there's some sort of meeting in Brussels. He said, they want some uh, technical advice on, on, on data communications here, I think it is. Do you think you'd be here for the meeting? So I said, when is it? He said, well, it's tomorrow morning. <laughs> so, so I said, well, if, if, if MPL Tablet can do it, and they did, and I actually got I managed to get a taxi and I arrived there at 10 o'clock at the, um, I forgot the name of the building now, I could, I could walk to it, I can't remember the name, Joy is on to that building at the end there. Anyway, um, so I walked going to this room and there's uh, sort of half a dozen people around and I said, Where, where's the UK delegation? And they said, aren't you it? <laughs> <laughs> and I, that's typical, I mean it really is, I, 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 later in some of these papers you'll see when all this happened and I, I got drafted ahead of quarters and I, I wrote a, a note about what a mess Britain had made of everything, you know, it wasn't the time we got our act together. And, uh, but that was typical. And uh, uh, really, we played it by ear, at least in my terms, we played it by ear. The French grew it, they were all organised, they decided exactly what was going to be done, uh, what was going to be said, they couldn't go outside their limit, uh, you know, the, what their, their brief was. But in our case, you all played it by ear. Now, you know, sometimes you win like that, but, you know, more often than not, I don't think you do. Anyway, that's, that's a, a bit of background, but that's what happened. Um, the thing had been set up by senior officials, and Brian Oakley actually appeared in that as, a, as a, 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 one of the senior officials, so he was, a, if you like, a gain of connection in the background. <coughs> I was, a, a, was a, well, in the end, actually, the French rang up the UK, they rang up a Brian, Brian was head of um, computer applications branch, and the French rang up uh, the UK, and they, whoever in the UK has got them to Brian, and Brian got them and said, the French would like you to be the project director. And I said, like I said to Ted, well, I'm not sure I can do that. And Brian said, we'd like you to do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I thought, oh dear. <laughs> anyway, that's what happened, and I, so I became project director for that, and I moved into the Petrobras building, to, into the corner office near building 93 Crom site, and it was some years afterwards that I discovered that that was the um, office that um, uh, Paul Dean had earmarked for himself, but he had to give it up because the, the, the commission were paying 10,000 a year for it, or worse that effect, <laughs> and I, I, whether that affected my career in later life, I don't know, but anyway. So, uh, I was actually saved by Jeff Tuchel. Jeff, I, I, I thought Jeff might have been here this evening, but Jeff, um, he was offered to me from headquarters. I think he'd just come back from Esfet. He'd certainly been, he'd worked on the original Manchester. I, I said Mark one, but it might have been e even before that. And uh, <clears throat> in fact, I believe he'd written the first program for it, a thing to calculate crimes. Anyway, he came to me and 
Um, he could speak French, right? That was a tremendous uh, advantage straight away because I, I couldn't. In fact, he was so good. We'd go into a hotel, you know, <coughs> later on when we were travelling around, and they'd say to him, "What in French, of course? What part of France do you come from, sir?" <laughs> so I mean, he was as good as that. And I even discovered on one occasion when we got diverted from Brussels to um, uh, Antwerp because of fog, and we had to be bus to Brussels from there. We got in this coach. And, and Jeff struck up a, this a conversation with a driver in French. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, until that time, I had no idea that he could speak French as well. And his German was quite good. So he was actually a tower of strength and, and fundamentally sort of handled all the admin side and let me get on with the, the technical stuff. I had three assistants, um, Thomas, the, the right to start with this well, they changed afterwards, but Michel de Paz had stayed with me all the time. Uh, Kurt Muller came across. Um, there was a funny story about Kurt and he came to the meeting, I told him, I sent an MPL drive where I said to the driver, hold up a sign, MPL, and a, a Dr. Muller will come up to you and, and bring him to the, to the lab. So we waited, I think half past ten came, Kurt Muller appeared and we waited, when he got to 11, I said, we'd better get on the meeting. And eventually it was about 12 o'clock or gone before Kurt and Muller turned up. And this is what happened. The driver had gone there, he'd held up an MPL, a chap had come out and said, I'm Dr. Moulou in, in, in sort of broken Swiss. And uh, so the driver said, right, so there's a car. And they, they set off. And uh, after a while, this chap leans forward to the driver, Ben and says, this isn't the way to an MPL. And the driver said, well, God, it really is. And after some little altercation, the chap said, and this was processing the boy, because this isn't the way to MPL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, well, I did a taxi, <laughs> swearing at me for not having met him. Yeah, but, 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 but. <laughs> you wouldn't believe it, would you? Two mullers on the same flight, both looking for MPL. Um, anyway, I had uh, uh, Giovanni Cassin, uh, Thomas Cully, of course, in, in uh, uh, featured. Well, in fact, they, I've got a. a, a part of a paper which I'm going to copy for you on um, how a networking began, which I've done recently. Um, Bob Wilmot, uh, from the, the Germany, GMD, I was rung up and told that Herr Wilmot would come to me for an interview. So I thought, gosh, okay, let's see what this Herr Wilmot is. Right, when he walked in, he was English, and he'd been over there, working over there on a sort of sabbatical or something, they'd nominated him to to serve on this. So for the German, I got an Englishman, which again was an enormous relief. Um, then there was the iron specica specification. Uh, that was hilarious. Perhaps later we can talk a bit more about that. But I can remember this was where connection oriented connection was really exactly there. I became, it became aware that as we tried to work out the specification, <coughs> as soon as someone would think of some property which implied that you had to have dynamic resource allocation. Somebody else would think of a property that you would have to have, which wouldn't make that possible, like an end-to-end -end, you know, connection. And I'm chairing this lot, and we're getting more and more requirements, and, and I think, yeah, there's no way we can do this. And in the end, I got the breakthrough. I had mandatory requirements and non-mandatory. Now, I didn't really say they didn't have to be built in. They all had to be built in, of course, which satisfied everybody. But later on, one could elect which ones to have. And that, got, that broke the log jam, and we actually got specification. Then we had to choose a contractor. We had this uh, we take grand meeting in, in, in Brussels. Um, we had 50, no, more than that. Uh, anyway, a hell of a lot of people turned down. Oh my God, um, how are we going to cope with this? So I made a very narrow filter. There had to be um, two companies from more than one country and they had to have had a background in this and that and so on. Eventually, we managed to get it down to five of which Capsodity and Sazological and more or less level pegging, um, except that the French wanted Capsodity and everybody else wanted Sazological. So we had this deadlock situation. Um, but we've done it all with a marking scheme and I've actually prepared um, some uh, graphs which showed bias in the market. And uh, Jeff Tutor whispered to me, would you like me to do this now? And he quietly went around and with that, the, 
I'm being recorded. I hope this isn't going to be publicly <laughs> <laughs> available. But uh, Jeff went round, and, and all of a sudden, the French complaints collapsed because you know that was where the bias had come from. And so we eventually got Cesar Logica. Well, then uh, I won't go down this, but there was a management committee. The, the, the tag, which I chaired with Jeff as um, uh, secretary, and, and Roger actually represented the UK on that. Uh, then the Centre's Coordination Group, which Michel the Page chair, and John Lewis is on that. And it was that group that made it work, basically, because they were the people that had to implement the software. They, they were the people that selected, if you like, the bits of the spec that they could actually implement. And that's how we actually got the, the thing right. Uh, well, no, but we'll leave it there. Um, then we had this grand presentation of the European Informatics Network, and I'm going to show some slides in a moment which would say something about that. Um, it was called a concourse of computers. I, I recently wanted to call it a conclave of computers, but Giovanni Etching explained that the Roman Catholic Church might take a dim view of that, because <laughs> conclave was when the Cardinals got together, and I didn't want an international incident, so I toned it down a bit to concourse in the written thing, but I stuck, as you'll see, to my slide on the conclave with a cardinal's hat. It's, 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 that's the we'll see that in a minute. Um, then we had, I've already mentioned that I chaired the, the pre-X25 meeting, that I was involved with the NSP, Arthur Inwee, um, SEP, and study group 7. Interestingly enough, in, again a little bit aside, but um, we had um, uh, on the um, uh, Inwee, there were a number of Americans and um, I'm trying to get the tax name now. Um, it'll probably come to me after the meeting. But he, he was over at this meeting, and they were talking about X25. And he said to me, you yeah, know, he said, it's not going to work. He said, there's, there's no uh, opportunity for end to end um, signaling for sub addresses. There's no mechanism for that. So I said, go and tell them. So he said, okay, you got up, and, 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 and that, it was that that led to the D-bit. If it hadn't, hadn't been for that, there wouldn't have been a D-bit in X25. Well, it might have been later on, but that was a direct input through Inrig of someone who knew what they were talking about. Yeah? Anyway, um, the, the other thing I was going to talk about was publicity and conferences. Um, I did start to prepare a slide of all the conferences and things that we've been to, but it got into about four or five pages, and so on, so I, I didn't show that. But actually at that time, I mean, Roger did an awful lot, we all did an awful lot of giving papers at conferences uh, and trying to, to spread the gospel. Um, well, I'm just at the end now. One last slide here. I'll put that up because just towards the end of EIM, while I still feel fairly powerful, um, I wrote a paper, and I've actually, well, what I'll do, I, I know what I'll do, I'll actually probably read a bit of it out to you. But I wrote a paper basically saying that, that uh, we, we'd had these ideas and we'd actually missed it. That was the, the, the tenor of, of the thing. And I sent it to, to uh, Duncan Davis, who was chief scientist then. And that led to, to some interesting <coughs> interactions and eventually we have been dragged up to headquarters. Um, I'm not sure it's for punishment or not, I'm not sure, but that's what happened. But I, I was basically saying that the UK had had the MPL Data Communication Network. The MinTech Network was a sorry tale. Um, it, it's in, in the paperwork at the end. Uh, we nearly got a four node <coughs> network. It was ISRV, um, NEL, um, probably AWRV and MPL. I think it was. We were going to have a, a four node network with a cross Farmer, Farm, hmm? which is a uh, roll up aircraft and stuff. Oh, was it? Yes, yes, you're quite right. I knew I, you know, for, uh, for, So we had these four centres, and we were going to have a, um, a, a ring with a one, one cross-connection. In fact, we, we discussed in my study, I remember, remember that, I've got the, the bits of paper. And <coughs> I think what killed it in there was a change of government, uh, probably. That was the excuse. But, you know, it just never, it never really quite got the support we should have had. Uh, then, of course, there was EPSS. And by the uh, time that they got to the the post of this persuaded them so we needed a public packet network. It was PSS and they went out and bought, you know, foreign kit. So I think that was enough to disgrace, um, frankly. And I said so and I'll read it out in a minute. 
But um, we, I said to try to make a comeback in, in the Albi. I, I, I left, I resigned from the department in the end, and I went to join Logic Bird, and I suppose that was an advantage in a sense because I got seconded back in. Um, I remember Philip Hughes saying to me, they want somebody, you know, would you like Logic Bird, like are you interested? And I said, well, I mind. He said, well, go and talk to Brian Oakley, because I'm with Brian Oakley. You know, I'd, I'd sort of bumped into him over the years on an office I tried to explain. And he just said, when can you start? So that's how I got into the RV director. And because I was a man from industry, who actually knew how the civil service worked or didn't work. And that was both a, a, a pleasure and a pain. <laughs> anyway, that's it. Really, I'm not going to talk in here, but I'm not going to say anything about uh, RV at all. That's much too recent. But other than to say that I did actually manage to set up a high-speed network project, but it was it greatly reduced in the end, lots of it had to be chopped off because of the, I got, got now, do you know, I had, a, I had no budget to start with, I was given a five million pound budget out of petty cash, and I spent 13 and a half million before they rumbled me. <laughs> so, but it was, it was still minuscule compared with most of the budgets, you know, 30, 14 million pounds for ITBS and that sort of thing. Anyway, but I did get two budgets off the ground, Admiral and Unison, and they were actually derived from the um, Universe project, which had been a satellite project. And um, that was what Jim Merriman came, came in and, and argued quite, quite strongly, something like that, which helped, as I said earlier. But um, Brian actually warned me that there'd be very little chance of us having any satellites in it. And indeed, it was right. I, mean, I, I, I hoped to get a satellite link, but never managed to. We never managed that. Anyway, that, that's enough on our week. I've said that in, in the States, the uh, ARPANET, then Telenet, and in fact I've got the brochure for the MPAT 5000, which was a X25 interface to packet networks. I think it must have been just about the earliest bit of, of a kit that appeared. Um, we could have had things like that. I mean, we actually had boxes. We had EMU in, in, in um, you wouldn't believe this, but we, we built an X25 adapter for EIN called EMU, um, EIN matching unit. And um, uh, I was going to say ostrich, it, it, it buried its head in the sand, but that's a different animal. But this, we built this <coughs> box, and uh, do you know what, what the post office used it to accept this test, the first nodes for, for the uh, for, for urine, yeah, which had X25 on it. So I, I don't know how they'd have done the acceptance test without our box, but that's another little story. <coughs> the French had RCP6, had the cigar. Um, and then uh, Transpat, Canada Data Pack, and Scandinavia went off with the Nordic Net with X21. And I was actually privileged to attend their, um, one of their meetings, and, and they ignored completely what I said. <laughs> so there we are. Well, I'll just read this if I may, and then ha have the film. I, I'm sorry I've gone on a bit long. I hope that's not, you, you bear with me. Um, <clears throat> I said here, small step for Britain. It was, you know, the, the space <coughs> on uh, sort of. Uh, analogy here, a giant slide for the rest. And basically I said that um, we, 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 in Britain, I said uh, we, we designed this small um, network and so on, uh, we tried to spread the word around and so on, but the, the results basically seem to have been as follows, and I'll just read this out from my MPL conceives and plans model public data net with local areas connected by a trunk network. This is the basic scheme of further new ideas for 1966 onwards. Cannot get support for trunk network and decides to build in house local area as a test bed. But make simulation studies of a trunk network to confirm its feasibility. Local network uh, working late 1969. Might even have been earlier, but I mean, I know. Two. After in USA plans, national network is encouraged by MPL published ideas and goes ahead with speed. Beginning with a trunk network and adding local switches later. Operational early 1970s. <coughs> Three, MPL develops a plan for large scale experiment in the UK with a trunk net linking RE, RRE, NEL, and MPL, the MinTech net, but this is blocked after organisational changes. Four, post office interested at technical level and places four study contracts with uh, UK industry. I've got somewhere one of the reports in one of those studies. Um, <coughs> these are placed in mid-68. Um, five, general 
skepticism of telephony experts on a world scale inhibits early acceptance of packet switching, but UK ideas on packet switching are presented at CCITT in 1959, thus NPO work is given international exposure. Six, interest in UK industry non-existent until other countries begin uh, exploitation. The UK post office system X dominates the telephone industry, while the computer industry is concerned only with private networks. I may have been being a bit unfair, but that was how I saw it, and this is what I wrote. Seven, France Bill's research network CCAT 1973, quite late really, publicises it widely at international conferences and claims successes rather beyond achievement. Eventually, CCLA before nodes is ranked by the uninitiated with ARPANET having over 60. That's perfectly true. It's all the same breath about them. While the early British pioneering work seems almost unknown outside the UK except by the state. Eight, the cost group plans European Informatics Network in 1971. Project begins in 73, etc., etc., brings together European research. Nine, commercial development of Telenet in the USA derived from ARPANET but later adopting CCIP standards, operational since 75. 10, UK post office decides around 74 on a national experimental network, EPSS. This is rather elaborate and over-designed as an experiment. It's late, 1976. French PTT, um, I hope there's nobody in the audience who's going to really <laughs> get up that those. French PTT plans public network transport on rather different principles it? and aggressively promotes these at international meetings. Transpac and EPSS are dissimilar, and Transpac, helped by Telenet, wins at CCITP with the FN5 proposal. Do you remember the, um, line, the line signaling protocols and so on? That makes a black, black feel what it was. The UK Post Office eventually supports the F25 virtual circuit interface. Transpac becomes operational late 1978. Well, there it was, and I go on to say events have proved that the UK was first but lost out and so on. And as I said, that actually, well, I finish up. <clears throat> in short, the whole process of taking innovation, this is my last paragraph, from the laboratory to the international marketplace must be treated as a conflict of national interest, which indeed it is. Written can and must do better. That's what I've written because, I've, in fact, I've got some interesting comments here about the, all of the EIN nodes and their achievement. And I make the point, and you'll better read it if you've got time, that MPL basically, and it's almost cut again nationally, you know, and it's nice again. MPL wrote the software, they tested, they didn't announce it until it worked. And you had people like um, uh, ISPA wrote, would you believe, the packet switch in the IBM mainframe. Can you imagine if you're writing a paper, packet switch in the mainframe? But of course, because of the high level programming talks and so on, they, they knocked it out quickly. Now, I don't believe it ever worked. I don't, I don't believe anybody could communicate with it. And this wasn't untypical. I mean, not, they weren't all that bad. And it was usually MPL who had to sort them out by doing conformance testing, uh, you know, quite trying to interact with them. But that was the sort of thing that happened. And so there's a difference, very often, a different attitude towards doing a job and engineering and making it work in this country as some of the others. And I, I, I tried to get this message over uh, at, at that time. But as I say, I designed to be Anyway, I'll stop at that point. I'm sorry I've run, run on at some length. In fact, much longer than I meant. I think if we could just have the, the film now, and then I'll probably dispense with the slides. Well, the film is a film which it shows the MPL network, and I'll let you have the secret. It was actually slightly faked up. I remember when we came to it, we couldn't quite put the thing working, but you, I hope you won't detect that. Um, do I just press the... Um, there it is. Oh. Uh, <laughs> And I'll come and have a rest. Oh, does this have the lighting to go out? I think I can probably write it. Okay. I thought we had sound. We had all the lights off. Yeah. Well, the soundtrack. We should have sound on it, actually. If I know this time. I can remember the sound <laughs> 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 uh, Can you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the 
lady who has now left shows how to thread the film and run the film. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You hardly recognise yourself. Eh? <laughs> oh, dear. Well, you... Yeah, well, you get up and tell them it's <laughs> <laughs> Well, this, of course, is trying to explain the, the idea behind the buffer in the middle instead of a, a circuit switch and putting things into a buffer and, and, uh, and then forwarding them. I think that's pretty what he was trying to say. Where is Tammy soundtrack? It, it's virtually useless without the soundtrack. Well, I, I mean, mm. yeah. Well, the circuit switching the first one. Yeah, the first one was circuit switching. Yes, you're quite right because of the cross in the middle of the circuit. This is the buffer, and then a stacking a number of buffers, of course, in the machine store as you handled the number of coins. Oh. Ah. Is it a non-standard film with the soundtrack on the wrong side or something? Yeah, yeah. It's a magnetic Yeah. It's magnetic. Yeah. You need to check if the gel being from solar. What a shame. It definitely had a soundtrack. <laughs> Well, this is this is oh this is good. This is the um the, we had four buttons. And in fact, I've got uh, I've got, got one of these. Oh, but I, I can do this bit. We, we had a, these are the four buttons that we had for working the network. You had basically hello, which is essentially interrupting the machine to say you want to make a call. Um, you could send um, information. Um, you could you could obviously get things back, but you might want to interrupt that. So you had an interrupt button, which you could kill the, the flow coming to you, and you had a goodbye. But I mean, no doubt when you get the film, I might sure tell you how it really worked. Um, but uh, I thought this along in case you actually wanted to see the real thing. Well, if we have much more trouble, we'll, we'll give up. But I tell you what, while you're fiddling with that film, why don't I show a few slides yes. to keep the audience happy? <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, yes. <coughs> now that's actually got nothing to do with networks, but I think it's rather a nice picture. <laughs> <laughs> it was. I was going to try and push button on the side of the light. It's leg, it's leg, I'm pretty bad. Oh, it's right. You're right. Oh, I'm losing my time. Oh, I've got it, I've got it. It's at least four weeks. Not the first time I've had to mend a projector at the beginning of the lecture. Um, okay, now, actually, I showed that because that was the alcohol still that we built in the data control. And Percy Hammond said to me, um, I want some instrumentation on it. And since nobody had any idea what they want, it actually in the, end, in the end led to the standard interface and the idea of modular boxes and things like that. So if I put that up to start things off, and then now I've put the right there, I can't see the <laughs> oh, um, And then that the level of the standard interface. I'm not going to sort of give you a lecture about this, I'll just whip through them, but that explained the idea of any source and any data. Um, novel ideas in those days, you could join together with the standard interface. And uh, this was a kind of uh, control signals. It's very interesting, actually. I'm sure that this came before the, the P and Q um, uh, process interlock in the software. But we never made much of a, a, a noise about it. So basically, this was a hardware inter interlock scheme for controlling the information passage between. Um, oh, uh, part of, we built a whole load of, of things. These were in no special order. I, I arrived too late to put them in the right places. But we actually had an infrared link um, between the computer science building in 1993 and 
the top of the ACE building and then down into ACE. So we actually were able to send data from building 93 over to the ACE. Um, I, I think this was really ahead of its time, <coughs> some years before. Uh, even now, if oh. red links don't actually work too well, you can see. Um, oh, well, it doesn't matter, it's upside down. That was a, uh, we had a lot of novel ideas, and that was a good idea. You were supposed to, um, uh, we wanted to collect data on a tape recorder, but you wanted to interrogate it with a data link and read it back. Okay, so you wanted a permanent record, but you wanted to have a sample it every now and again. And what happened was you had this tape going around the white perfectly glue, and a head whizzed round on an arm, and it read the tape before the tape and the tape moved on to the the tape I spoke. <coughs> really, very like a video recorder. If only I patented that thing, <laughs> <laughs> and I made a poem out of it. So these are just sort of another blue patch. Um, oh, that was an amusing one. Um, that was a typewriter. How do you get coded information out of a typewriter? Well, we painted a binary code on the inside of the hammer, and then as the hammer is painted up, you read the code off. Um, <laughs> I think it was doomed, actually, for then. <laughs> uh, that, uh, that just talks about the handshake. I'll read it out. That's just explaining the, the internal bit. That one's upside down. <laughs> Show that one. <laughs> Now that, now that one, I think you'd like that one. You can all read that, of course. <laughs> 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 so, uh, I went to the Novice of Beers, actually, again, this is another one of the dogs. He came to Marston and he said, he said, I'm supposed to be going to um, the All Union um, Conference in Akadem Gorda. He said, Novice of Beers, he said, in Russia. He said, Can you go? Well, I went. I could, actually, I could spend half an hour telling you what happened. I won. And it was only, it was only a fortnight ago. Uh, I was at the, M the MPL Retired Staff Association, and I was chatting with Donald, and uh, I said, you know, I remember that happening. I said, you know, I'm sort of pity you couldn't go. And he said, um, well, he said, I couldn't go. He said, because I've been talking to USHQ, and they wouldn't let me go. So that was the lumber with, with the appalling so That's what that, that's the translation. <laughs> uh, that's actually what, what he said to me. It, it, actually, was one very interesting thing. There was a young, um, a, a, not an academician, a candidate called Matienko. And he came to me and he said, I have been charged with um, being your interpreter. I said, OK. And, and he came out of the hotel and I spent some time with him discussing this. And he was very, he would say to me, I can put this in Russian with that phrase or that phrase. This one actually means that, this means that, which do you want? So I had a fairly good idea that he was going to render the, 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 the paper quite well. But he wasn't, because you're a candidate and not an academician, he was not actually allowed to get the paper. So I had to stand there and get the paper, sentence by sentence, and Matienko would then speak it in Russian and the slide would come in Russian and describe it in so And I, I think it went over quite well. And um, Gordon Starrett was out there as well, same conference, and he had um, uh, a Russian who was um, an ICL um, employee. And so uh, he had the scheme where his uh, Russian speaking employee would give his lecture on the platform, and he followed mine as And Gordon would go down into the um, projection box and he would actually give a commentary in English, of course, about his slides. Um, for all the English speaking, it was a brilliant idea, and marvellous. So I sat down there and got the headphones on my head and it was a classic comedy sketch. The projection got the slides wrong. <laughs> and all the way through, Gordon was one slide, <laughs> it was one slide out, he was saying, up in the top left hand corner, you can see it, it got nothing to do with it. It's <laughs> hilarious. Um, oh, this, well, this, this, uh, as I say, I wanted to. Um, that, I've seen one of those, it's the other way up. <laughs> I didn't realise that the internet was so uh, undeniable. Um, oh, well, this, this detail is how the network works. So I'm going to give you a flavour of the way slides develop, too, our techniques for making slides. You know, I used to draw them uh, by hand on a big sheet of paper hanging on my whiteboard, and then they used to come in with a camera and photograph them. That's how we did it in the, in the early days. But, um, what exactly happened to you? Well, unfortunately, I think I need to take a photo.
Oh, this, now that was interesting. That was the alternating bit protocol. Roger will, will remember this because he and Pete actually both read the paper. He was responsible for working it out, actually, anyway. And um, this was, was a very, very neat, actually, um, uh, way of, of doing error, error control, uh, you know, detecting errors and then and handling the big patches. I won't attempt to, to, to describe it this evening. And <laughs> but uh, but it, it was adopted in the ARPANET, uh, and it was years afterwards when they were looking around, and they thought that the paper described that was an academic paper. I had no idea. And it came as an utter surprise that that project had actually been implemented in the internet. Would you remember that? Oh, yeah, that's absolutely amazing. Um, that was the roughly the way the networks work. It, it, it was a very ingenious design, really. You had uh, uh, three layers of multiplexer. And so the multiplexing was basically done by what level of multiplexer you came in. Each multiplexer was eight ways. Okay, so if you wanted a high speed circuit, you were attached at a, a, a higher level, you got a, a, a lower speed from you. Went down the basic well, I put that in um, um, because that showed how it used to be before uh, packet networks. You have to have a modem for every line coming into the main frame. I normally put that slide uh, earlier on. It, it, it literally meant you had a modem on every line at the input to your main frame. That was how the MPL, those are the main MPL network modules. You had um, the, 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 multi, the, the sort of collection of multiplexes, um, which fed into the, um, the switch itself, the input output control. There was a, a DMA scheme whereby you just stuff things into stored in the sign and space. And uh, you had a peripheral control unit at the other end of the line terminals, and it was this thing that had these buttons on. So you had a, a sort of an interaction between the peripheral control unit and the input output control. Oh, uh, and this is the point I hand over to Roger to complete it. I won't go any further because it could get the film going to explain it. That was the really the state transition diagram for that. That was uh, when uh, some of the um, simulation work I mentioned. Um, this was, no it wasn't. Uh, that was just showing that high speed, uh, high level network <coughs> of the interface computers. Because in the MPL design, um, although the switch itself was basically a combined um, high-level packet switch and an, um, you know, an interface machine. Uh, in ARPANET, they actually did have a separate network, which was the IMPS interface message processors, and then they had other machines called TIPS, which are terminal interface processors. And they, they got them split out. Uh, that, that, these, were, these were just I, mean, uh, I wanted to give you a favour of some of the sort of pictures that we tried to put ideas over. This was interesting, actually, because we had a one twenty, I think it was, John Sexton did a lot of very interesting graphics work early on, and this was um, a tablet which I suppose it was people did. Anyway, we had a, 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 a pedal in this We had this tablet, and you can see there that, that um, there it's up on, on the screen having been written on the tablet. And only now are, are these pen, um, you know, pocket pen driven um, uh, notebook machines coming along. So that was another thing that we did, trying to ahead of trying to be effective, I suppose. Oh, uh, that was Donald's work on the algorithmic scheme. The idea there was, of course, if you've got any resource, you could find a dynamic, a dynamic share like the road system, you all are up to a certain level, and as you offer more and more traffic, all of a sudden it grinds to a halt. And the idea that Donald had was that you um, would hold off packets when you got to a certain level of packets inside the network. And this basically was the um, curve you've got by simulation showing where an optimum for the number of packets in the network was. Um, that, that never really got anywhere that, of course, but you know, it was all part of the general sort of work that was going on in different Oh, now we're on to the other end. Lots of different countries involved. I'll go fairly quickly through these, but I think it's useful because it was Europe's packet network. So um, there's a set of fairly, uh, sort of, I'll go fairly quickly because the time to tell the story. That was largely the, the history of the IN from the study when I went in 1970 
as the UK delegation, I've already told you, until the eventually the thing was shut down uh, in, uh, in 1980. So they, they were the main events. And when I put IC, I took the C72, 74, 76, 78, I did a series of papers which reported the progress. So if anybody is it, should happen to be interested in it, by reading those four papers, you get a fair um, idea. Now, there, there you had primary centres, the five in the middle, and then you had secondary centres that were basically dial up to those uh, uh, primary centres. So the primary centres were on the, um, uh, the, the, the centre, well, the basic ring with one cross, cross uh, call. And um, I called it there a, a concourse of computers, if you can see. Uh, that was the, the physical arrangement. Again, the blue was the EIN um, main uh, network, and then these were the dial up lines. Uh, this was trying to give some idea of the layered nature of, of all of these networks, basically. They are a good thing. And you basically had the EIN terminals, which, which by means of data transportation and processing, uh, gave you access to services. And we had quite a lot of services actually on, on the network there. We had scrapbook and edit, I mentioned. Conclave was the, was the scrapbook um, uh, conferencing. Again, uh, way ahead of its time, the really, uh, conferencing system. Um, Stokes, I think, that was a hardware, if I remember rightly. Um, CFAX, of course, we had. And in fact, um, we'll, we'll see that in a minute. And Pat would have had some slides. So I, actually was able to show CFAX in Canada in 76 at the Toronto IEEC um, because we, it was pulled off air into the MPL network and the MPL network it was stuck into EIN to Paris and then in EI, uh, the French PTT when we did find a, 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 a lease line to data pack that was piped over, data, uh, over that lease line into data pack and data pack into the um, centre and as far as I know, that's probably the first real international hookup of the first. Anyway, there's my conclave, my cardinal's hat, showing that it was a conclave of computing people. I know we had a number of, um, uh, well, these, these were explaining how you, how you, you logged in at NPO. This, this was, we had a number of slides for each of the centres, roughly the same set of slides, but different. Um, blue ones, because they would log in in different ways, and these were NPL, and so it, it, it told you how you logged into Slack, but you asked for conclave, etc, etc, and, and how that, that, that worked. And then we had live demonstrations. Um, uh, I'll go fairly quick, because I, I just don't go into great, great detail, even if I can remember, I'll be almost at the end. Um, well, that was, that was basically the next thing. Um, that was that was the interface of that direct 25 that I mentioned. Um, that was, uh, we connect you around there. This was now building up the picture for the tax um, for the new process. Uh, we're getting more and more of a hub, of our, of the EIN as a hub supporting all those different mainframes. They're all connected, and then each mainframe supported services. And and eventually, that, that, was a, that was the overall picture. I think I'll end on that one with EIN, with a number of catch networks, Harwell Mesh, EPSS, the MPL Net, um, the X25 adapter to uh, the CPAD network and so on. So that, that actually was the, the, the uh, EISDN. Um, so I'll stop at that point. I don't think there's anything. Um, if we can turn that off, and I think we probably have to get the film on this now. I think so. I think that had actually broken. Yeah. Okay. I think I'll. Um, right. Okay. Just to, um, do you have any questions, sir? Yeah. Yes, by all means. Yes. I'll have a glass of water first. Yes. Thank you, mate. Thanks. All right. Yes. Yes. I need to tell you the story of that. Yes, in fact, Frank Cousins, of course, was the um, 
a union for university, and the technology. And he just made um, uh, Minister of Technology, and he was due to come down and open the building. Now, um, Donald told me this fairly recently that he never actually turned up, there was some other pressing government business. So it was open by one of his. Slow. That's right, that's right. That's right. The two cultures, man. And the plane flew over, and he stopped talking, and I got a turn to us next to him and said, I'll speak for him, but I'll be down to our shout for him. You know, you're right, right. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Anyway, Donald told me that he used to irritate him. He used to go into the building and he'd see this plaque on the wall saying this building was owned by the um, train cousins, you see. And he was, you know, he really irritated him because it wasn't true. And Donald, you know, really that's things to be right. So he, he rang up the director and he said, um, what's the very happy about this? And the director said, well, I leave it to you. So Donald came in early one morning with a screwdriver, unscrewed it, and as far as we know, it's still behind the cupboard in his office. <laughs> <laughs> good, good question. We were given lunch on that occasion at long tables of visitors. I can't remember who was sitting back opposite me, but just to that side was Alan Turing's mother. Really? Because, um, yes, he must have, it was about the year before, wasn't it? Yeah, was it? 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, Thank you.